welcome to Watchtower History. So Watchtower in the Golden Age would not only quote questionable medical opinions, but also medical opinions from anti-Semitic sources in support of their theories. Now, McFadden was known for some of his anti-Semitic views. And Watchtower is quoting McFadden in his publication in various of their Watchtower publications. One example of that is Bernard McFadden and his Physical Culture magazine. And that was often referenced in the Golden Age in those earlier years, in the 1920s and 1930s. Like the Populist Party and the Jewish conspiracies that Rutherford republished, McFadden would often resort to forgeries to support his anti-vaccination views. And these forgeries and ideas being repeated in the Golden Age. In Tony Willis's A People for His Name, he says that the Golden Age became the happy hunting ground for all manner of quack doctors. In its pages, Diet remedies fought with grape cures as cures for everything from the common cold to cancer. Allopaths, osteopaths, naturopaths, homeopaths, and chiropractors, all medical practitioners, but the orthodox, had free expression. The dangers of the use of aluminum cooking utensils and vaccination were forcefully impressed on its readers. Sometimes the major part of an issue of the magazine was devoted to medical propaganda, and no issue went by without some mention of it. The American Medical Association was ridiculed by the Golden Age in the same manner as the clergy were ridiculed by Rutherford in the Watchtower. Time magazine even talked about McFadden in a way that was not all too favorable. It said, Publisher McFadden states that Mr. Katzkoff is a graduate in law, pharmacy and medicine, a prominent physician, psychologist, and author. But medical authorities point out that Katzoff graduated from the Georgia College of Eclectic Medicine and Surgery and holds his licenses to practice from the electric boards of Georgia and Connecticut, which have been under fire in connection with recent scandals in medical licensing. Katzoff was recently called before the special grand jury which has been investigating matters in Connecticut. In regards to the Golden Age and McFadden's abhorrence of vaccinations, William Hunt's Body Love, The Amazing Career of Bernard McFadden, says compulsory vaccination was an anathema to McFadden for years. It outraged him that children could not attend school unless their parents submitted to vaccination. This forced him to keep his own children out of the public schools it forced him also into some dubious stories about vaccination. The graphic even dared to try to convince a morning nation that movie star Rudolf Valentino had died because of a serum injection. Anti-vaccination articles were standard fare in the graphic and in physical culture. The American Medical Association did manage to expose some of these efforts, as with an article by G.W. Desbro entitled vaccination killed my two sisters after a furious exchange of letters mcfadden conceded that there is no such person as dr desbro mcfadden also used an article by lee a stone said to be an army surgeon fishbein checked and found no record of stone with the army another frequent magazine contributor was dr frank crane presented as a medical man but who was in fact a graduate in theology. Crane was not even a practicing reverend, but a syndicated producer of trite aphorisms for daily prayers and babbit hunting periodicals. He is the apotheosis of the Pollyanna school of thought. Like the case of Dr. Desbro, a man who did not actually exist, McFadden had published other medical articles by Dr. Edwin C. Bowers and Dr. Frederick Collins, who also did not exist. And these names also appeared in the Golden Age, the Watchtower, and other Watchtower-related publications. 
Now, McFadden and his periodicals were called out for their anti-Semitism and their anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, just as we've shown that Rutherford, the Watchtower, and the Golden Age were involved in during this period. Hunt's book continues. Liberty's greatest embarrassment came through the contributions of writer George Sylvester Viarek. Ausler alleged that he tried to discourage McFadden from using Viarek's work when he first started work as an editor in 1924, after pointing out that Viarek had been jailed as a German propagandist during World War I. McFadden did not believe the German-Americans' earlier patriotism made any difference, and Ausler talked to other important men who felt the same way. Thus, in the 1930s, Viarek was contributing interesting articles to Liberty, including an interview with Adolf Hitler that revealed the staunch anti-communist posture of the leader. Mary McFadden blamed Ausler in employing Viverek just as she blamed him for every other bad decision her husband made. She argued that Bernard was basically ignorant of foreign affairs. He had never, during our married life, shown any interest in news dispatches concerning political diplomacy. Ausler recognized that Viverek revered Hitler but continued to use his material because it was also evident that he rejected Hitler's anti-Semitism. Uh, let me interject here for a second. As I look through the Liberty magazine, there were articles for the Jews. There were articles against their Jews. There were articles for Hitler. There were articles against Hitler. There was articles for the Nazis. There were articles against the Nazis. There was a lot of this kind of stuff in McFadden's magazines and periodicals, not just in Liberty, but in physical culture and many of the other publications that McFadden was publishing at the time. Hunt's book continues. As the war pressures grew, also had to start rejecting the stories he received, and later the Justice Department prosecuted Viverek successfully as an alien propagandist. It does not appear that the propagandists had much luck in keeping Americans friendly to Hitler with his magazine work, and the exposure did not harm the reputations of McFadden and Auerstler. Before Pearl Harbor, McFadden was ousted from his place as publisher by stockholders, and Ausler took up war work. Under new management, the magazine carried on until 1950. And yet McFadden and some of his periodicals were called out for the anti-Semitism by the Jews with some very specific examples. In the Sentinel, Fishbein, the president of the American Medical Association at the time, had an editorial regarding McFadden. His question was, what are you selling now, Mr. McFadden? Bernard McFadden has devoted a lifetime to selling dubious literature and queer health theories to the American people. His appeal has been entirely to the low, low brow. He has catered to all the secret and obvious desires of the low, arrested mentality. His publications inflated the ignorant by telling them that muscles make up for brains and he tantalized with photographs of the near nude. Now Mr. McFadden has turned his attention to the Jews. He inserted ads in Metropolitan Dailies last week, announcing the publication in the January issue of his magazine, New Physical Culture, of an article titled Health, Jewish Question, Pogroms. The article bearing his byline praises the high health standard of the Jewish people, tracing it to the Kashruth laws, and claims that it is their health that has endowed them with superior qualities. He then mouths the usual Nazi lie. The Jews monopolize nearly all of what may be termed the outstanding desirable positions in Germany. He also warns of the possibility of pogroms in the United States if the Jewish race with only 3 or 4% of the population, should finally control all of the great business and professional groups. And so he's pushing some of the same ideas that Rutherford was pushing, that the Golden Age and Woodworth was pushing, that Henry Ford was pushing, and that Hitler and the Nazis were pushing, as well as Father Coughlin and, and others. The Sentinel editorial continues. Not that Mr. McFadden likes pogroms, but he does mention their possibility. 
By implication, he differentiates between the Jews and citizens of the United States. It is double talk and dangerous because of the type of person his magazine reaches. We recall that Father Coughlin began his social justice with a similar double talk. Is Bernard McFadden moving into Newfield? Barring anti-Semitism and Nazi ideology, his publications have always borne a close resemblance to Stryker's Thurmer, the Nazi paper. The Wisconsin Jewish Chronicle also mentioned the same thing. It said that the current issue of physical culture contains a signed editorial by Bernard McFadden, which praises the Jews, but proclaims that if Jews will continue capturing key positions in industry, pogroms are unavoidable. The piece is so skillfully written that many Jews reading it with superficiality will be fooled into believing that it's a defense of the Jews. It's a filthy piece of work. The Japanese newspaper reports that Rabbi Stephen S. Wise persuaded President Roosevelt to order the withdrawal of Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice from school shelves. Japan's morale must be pretty low if her propaganda mouthpiece could cock such ludicrous stories. Don't be surprised if the Polish minister to Mexico will have to resign because of the increasing horrification in American quarters over the treatment accorded Jewish inmates in the Polish concentration camps in Mexico City. Thanks to Walter Winchell for this suggested epitaph for Goebbels, from sauerkraut to sour grapes. And of course, that's just an attempt at humor in responding to something that was as horrific as what was being written in McFadden's periodicals. And remember, at the same time that all these things are going on, many of the Watchtower followers became naturopaths, became chiropractors, and were involved in a lot of these cures. Dr. Rollin Jones was Rutherford's personal physician, and he was pushing the removing of the cause of all diseases, acute or chronic, without drugs or surgery. He was pushing electrotherapy, that quack Abrams machine, hydrotherapy, mechanotherapy, and a healthy diet, proper food. In The Messenger, regarding the conventions that were going on in the 1920s and 30s, there are some pictures that we found of Dr. Rollin Jones and Dr. Eccles, who was the other chiropractic doctor that Rutherford was using at the time. Eccles was the one who suggested, of course, that Rutherford moved to San Diego. Uh, Eccles was the one who purchased the land for the Beth Serene Mansion as well. He must have been making pretty good money as a chiropractor. Now, Dr. Roland Jones was also a speaker for the Watchtower. He spoke on the millennial age in Tampa, Florida. And he died in 1959. And he remained a Jehovah's Witness until the very, very end. Now, the Yale Studies in Religion about the International Bible Students or Jehovah's Witnesses, written in 1933, says very much the same thing. It says, in recent periodical literature published by the Society, much has been said about vaccination and other practices common to the medical profession. It is asserted that millions of people in the United States are tired of the serum idea and will in the near future revolt against it. The implication is that the medical profession takes advantage of the unsuspecting public and uses its power to extract from the people whatever money it may. The laws regarding matters of health are formulated by the medical profession in its own special interest. A Bible student in the state of New Hampshire, having been indoctrinated by the vaccine of their propaganda, refused to obey the law on having his 12-year-old son vaccinated. He declared that the boy would never be made to submit to it. The father chose to spend 236 days in jail rather than to recognize the law in paying the fine which was imposed upon him. His jail experience was not necessary because of the inability to pay, but because he deemed his conduct to be a protest against what he believes is an unjust and unconstitutional law. 
the Golden Age commented, all the honesty and love of liberty of a true American cries out against such a misuse of power. The family made some vain attempts to procure a doctor's certificate showing the son to be unfit physically to submit to vaccination, but persistently refused to move out of the state or let the school doctor fulfill the legal requirement for school attendance. In the Politics of Healing, Histories of Alternative Medicine in the 20th Century North America, it says that we must first appreciate that outside of this little volume, outside of this volume, little really, no research has been done on mid-20th century movements against orthodox medicine. What we will find when we start exploring this unknown world could be quite surprising. For example, the only sustained work on the subject, Eric Junk's Quacks and Crusaders, reveals the surprising strength of figures such as the goat bland Dr. John Brinkley and alternative cancer entrepreneur Harry Hoxley. In 1932, Brinkley received 240,000 votes when he ran for governor of Kansas. Anti-vaccinationism was an integral part of this world of attempted sexual revitalization and anti-Semitism. Activist Norman Baker decried the horrors of vaccination of both children and livestock. Huxley, in turn, warned of the dictatorial power greater than that of Hitler or Stalin of the American Medical Association, which sought to vaccinate all children as part of its medical straitjacket. The rabidly anti-communist organization American Rally, which staunchly supported Huxley, denounced with equal fervor the United Nations and totalitarian health powers that sought to inject an untested polio vaccine in their mad scramble to launch a new money-making empire. Anti-fluoridationists also carried forth many anti-vaccination ideas during alternative medicine supposed years in the wilderness, as Gretchen Ann Riley's essay in this volume reveals. And yet, when we read this and we think about the exact same things that Rutherford, Woodworth, and the Watchtower was promoting at that time, there's no difference. They were identical. These were the ideas that they were pushing. And the sources that they were getting these ideas from were based on forgeries or complete all and out lies. And most of the ideas are not even accepted today. Even by the quacks, such as the milk diet, the grape diet, and some of the other things that appeared in the pages of the Golden Age or even that aspirin was the enemy. Now remember, William Jennings Bryan was attending the same chiropractic conferences that McFadden and some of the others were attending, including Clarence Darrow. Clarence Darrow was a friend of Bryan's, and the two of them were on opposite sides during the Monkey Scopes trial, shortly before Bryan's death. One of the bizarre ideas that the Golden Age was pushing from these various quack doctors and periodicals was the idea of aluminum poisoning. In the Warren Times Mirror, an editorial about more propaganda states that it is reported that there are abroad in this highways and byways of Warren County, again, propagandists who are spreading the tale that aluminum cookware is not safe to use. The fact that the propagandists are primarily interested not in the health of the prospective customer, but in selling another type of wear should be sufficient basis for suspicion. But since the shipbuilders apparently have fooled most learned and wise international statesmen with big Navy propaganda, it may be well to issue a word of warning to possible victims of the poison aluminum propagandists. A little further down, it talks about Dr. Betts, who had several articles in the Golden Age against aluminum cookware. About Dr. Betts, this editorial said that it appears that one important source of the propaganda is a statement issued by a, quote, Dr. Betts, unquote. Concerning this statement, Dr. Fishbein, familiar to Times Mirror readers as the author of the health article on this page, and editor of the American Medical Journal writes, his, Dr. Betts, 
reasoning is a typical example of the manner of mishandling medical statistics by those who have not the slightest conception of chemistry, medicine, or statistical analysis. It is difficult to understand why Beth should be so especially interested in attacking the use of aluminum ware and why his $1 pamphlet should be sent in considerable numbers without charge to various libraries and other public institutions and to dealers and hardware. Public education in matters of health is sometimes abused by those who, through the nature of their professional training, should be the first to protect the public confidence by spreading information based only on scientific fact. The pamphlet of Beth's is a pernicious attempt to promote a peculiar view of cancer without the slightest scientific evidence to support its promotion. In the Scientific American, this editorial states that the sum of our investigation is that there is no foundation for the belief that the use of aluminum cooking utensils is injurious. There is also no foundation for the absurd statement that aluminum or any other kind of cooking utensil has anything to do with the causation of cancer. And I like how they end this. It says, worrying about the hole in Jimmy's pants is far more likely to cause cancer than an aluminum saucepan. And so McFadden was a publisher of multiple magazines. And a lot of these were like the National Enquirer today. He was basically the founder or inventor of a lot of the National Enquirer type of magazines, including the faked photographic evidence. In Sue Hubble's From Here to There and Back Again, she states, Bernard McFadden, who died in 1955 at the age of 87, is remembered today as a bodybuilder, a health food advocate, and the inventor of cosmotarianism, the happiness religion. But McFadden also had a strong populist belief in the common man, and a shrewd business sense combined. These led him to establish such magazines as True Story, which endured to become the nub of Peter Callahan's McFadden Holdings. In McFadden's day, True Story editors were taxi drivers and dime store clerks who were ordered not to edit anything out of the confessions sent in by ordinary people. In 1924, he began the New Evening Graphic, a tabloid on the same principle, enlisting, whenever possible, participants to write the news and advising his editors, don't stick with the bare skeleton of facts. He built a machine called a composograph, and so they could enhance or alter a photo or pose them in certain ways to create an image for the story or even a forgery, a photographic forgery for the story. McFadden developed the composograph, a photograph that was enhanced, altered, sometimes posed. With a composograph, for instance, the graphic was able to show the King of England scrubbing his back with a brush inside his own bathroom. Tabloid pursuit of British royalty began long before Fergie and died. In 1927, the graphic brought both embellishment and the composograph into the famous divorce case of a teenage wife, Peaches Hennen, and her wealthy, publicity-hungry husband, Daddy Browning. I'll let Simon Bessie tell the story. Peaches' private diary was serialized and countless intimate pictures were printed. Among the numerous composographs were several of the graphic's outstanding achievements in this line. Daddy and Peaches were shown playing doggies in their boudoir under the headline, Woof Woof, I'm a Goof. Daddy was persuaded to adopt an African hawking gander as a pet and was pictured leading the bizarre animal about New York. The picture was captioned, Honk Honk, It's the Bunk. Today's popular folklore in the tabloids is available everywhere. Drugstores, supermarkets, newsstands, train stations, but only for a week and then it's gone. The publisher's own files are not public and few libraries aside from the Library of Congress, the research libraries of the New York Public Library and the Popular Culture Library in Bowling Green, Ohio, receive them. Those collections are incomplete. 
This means future folklorists may not be able to read that aliens consider the earth the ghetto of the universe, may never know that a Bible scholar says that heaven is full, or that a rare man-eating kangaroo kills 27 in Australia. And so not only were they creating forgeries to support these anti-medicinal conspiratorial ideas, but they're also fabricating photographic evidence. They're compositing photos together and creating their evidence and trying to pass it off as the real thing. Now, an interesting comment with that um, is it states they were everywhere. Drug stores, newsstands, train stations. Uh, what people don't realize, and when I was a boy, I caught the tail end before they all went out of business, but the drug stores were like the little five and tens. They were like they had a soda fountain. You could buy drug, your, your pharmaceutical needs, your aspirin, but it also so, sold convenient stuff that you would need, that you go to like a little hardware store, candy. You could get ice cream at the soda fountain and all that. People, before the internet and everybody got on their phones and computers, people would meet and go to places like that. And all this, when, when you, you think about it, all this news is being spread throughout the country through these, these means. Of, of train stay, everybody met and all that, but mainly the drugstores were the Starbucks of the day, with minus the 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 Wi-Fi where you had to talk to people and read the newspaper, or in this case his periodical while you're sitting there having your soda fountain and and coffee or whatever. And remember, McFadden's is kind of associated with the Populist Party. Same as Rutherford, same as Bryan, same as Henry Ford. And as Ford is publishing these anti-Semitic articles in the 1920s, and Rutherford's following suit as well in his magazine in the Woodworth and the Golden Age, McFadden's being called out for anti-Semitism by several of the Jewish newspapers in the United States. Like Ford, like... Yeah, the populace, like Rutherford, yeah. Again, the, now with McFadden, we've got both. We've got both the anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and the medical quackery and the medicinal conspiracy theories as well. And I'm glad I saw this just now. I didn't. I didn't notice this. In McFadden's day, true story editors were taxi drivers and dime store clerks, which, which I'm glad uh, I just noticed that Co corroborates um, what I said earlier. Being a, a remember as a boy going into these soda fountain places, and they were told specifically to lie, and that n nothing should be edited out from what their folks are telling them. And that they shouldn't even fact check the articles, just publish it. And who does that today? Still? The whole, the whole, that mindset of conspiracy, that mindset of anti-Semitism, of paranoia, even though it's a different organization, there's that same personality profile in each one. Now, there's a Dr. Morris Fishbein who wrote about McFadden's periodicals and quack medical advice. Dr. Fishbein was the president of the American Medical Association. Remember, the Golden Age had published a quote stating that Dr. Fishbein was the type of Jew that had crucified Christ. In Fishbein's The Medical Follies, he documents several of the examples of the forgeries and out and out lies in in Bernard McFadden's physical culture and other magazines. In McFadden's Liberty magazine, which we spoke about earlier, there's multiple examples of you know these articles that were or for Henry Ford, for Adolf Hitler against Adolf Hitler, for the Nazis against the Nazis, inciting to riot, a firsthand revelation of a communist plan for you. You can't say anything, you can't write anything, you can't have anything, you can't go anywhere, you can't learn anything, you can't do anything, except what you're told. Read the facts told for the first time. 
This communist fear-mongering is exactly what Henry Ford, Father Coughlin, Hitler and the Nazis were doing at the same time. Henry Ford talks about war and your future. And it even mentions that he was the only American favorably mentioned in Mein Kampf by Hitler. This fact, plus his pronounced but recently renounced views about the Jews, his isolationist associates and utterances, and his refusal early in this crisis to make airplane motors for Britain, put him on the spot. And yet when Ford talks about these things that he believed, they're exactly the same things that Hitler picked up and published in Mein Kampf. Ford said, money isn't wealth, he said. People are always confusing money with wealth. Production is the only way to create wealth. Money is necessary to organize businesses and keep homes running. It saves transportation. When you want to exchange the work you've put into raising a bushel of wheat, say, for the work someone else has put into making something, maybe a tool in another part of the country. Idle money never does anybody good. Gold is about the most useless metal we have. Remember, he was pushing the silver standard that the populist party and Brian and Rutherford were pushing. Ford continues, we kept about the same amount of money in banks for 30 years. The main reason is that if we had to borrow, the bankers would try to take our institution away from us. They tried that once. And remember, Ford was blaming the Jews for these things. And we've mentioned this before. Uh, the Golden Age printed this short article, Henry Ford thinks banks useless. And so they were following these ideas Ford and these various publications and newspapers, and they believed a lot of what Ford was pushing, as we've shown in our roadmap series so far. It gives us experience, and all we're here on earth for is to learn. Not knowing that he believes we are all destined to come back to earth again, and that he has said that he only hopes Mrs. Ford will be at his side, I said too lightly, I wonder. Feeling his reproving look, and the drivers, I added, I don't know, Mr. Ford. The older I get, the less I know. For instance, I never did understand how my mother, a widow with six children, always knew in advance when anything was about to go wrong. I've always thought it was because she was French, and the French were supposed to be intuitive. It's experience, Ford said simply. She'd lived before. What this is claiming and what this is suggesting and even what is in the Henry Ford movie, Henry Ford believed in past lives and that he had lived multiple past lives to gain experience to get to where he was. Those after the death of one body, excuse me, sir, inhabits another. <clears throat> and you know who they are? No. Well, you do. The same people have been fighting all this time. Wall Street brokers. Those fat cats, rich bankers, munition makers. You know who they all are? No. They're Jews, most of them. Henry. Well, they are, most of them. I won't well, I'm sorry, talk. they are, That's Clara. Right. Well, I'm sorry. They are. And it's a damn conspiracy, too. And it's all there in that protocols of the, uh, of the elders of Zion thing. It's all there. It's a conspiracy. Well, if they think I have lived all my life to get to where I am, to be brought down by a bunch of tricksters, they're wrong. Wrong. And there were many Masons at the time who believed very similar things. And remember, Henry Ford himself was a Mason. Which is ironic because the Nazis not only were opposed to the Jews, they were very, very opposed to the Masons as well. If they knew that their ideas had come from Henry Ford, who was a Mason, I think there would have been a whole different outlook on Henry Ford and, and his work by the Nazis. And as we've mentioned several times already in the roadmap series here, that Ford was such an idol to Hitler that he counted him as his inspiration. Henry Ford was Hitler's inspiration. He mentioned Henry Ford and Mein Kampf. He even had a portrait of Ford in his office not only in the 1920s, but even in the 1930s. Since we made this recording, an actual photo of Hitler with Henry Ford's portrait 
has surfaced. This photo is the current one on the wiki page about him. After one of our viewers, JW researcher Rose, colorized it, I happened to notice that the portrait of the individual behind Hitler had white hair. I recognized the pose instantly. And after using computer software to overlay that original photo at the same perspective as here, it matches perfectly. Other articles in the Liberty magazine were about the ambassador to Hitler, the private diary of William Dodd, the future of the Jews by H.G. Wells. What the Dyes Committee overlooked from the inside a startling expose of communist activities in the USA. This is early McCarthyism. In a letter to the editor, the Liberty Magazine's Vox Pop, there's an interesting one that mentions these particular ideas. And it says, below you will find a translation from the Deutscher Workoff and Biobachter and Free American from April 27th, 1939, which I made for you from the official Nazi organ in the United States. Even if the English looks quite rough, Nazi German since Hitler set the style in his Mein Kampf is equally elegant, which it really wasn't. The piece is worth reading until you get to the meat. And so this is an interesting letter. It says, recently there appeared in the well-known magazine Liberty, which belongs to the even better known Mr. McFadden, another one of those bare barred serials against the wild and despicable Nazis. The articles came from the pen of the industrious and avaricious wholesale writer Oscar Shinsgall. Mr. Shinsgall chose as the locale for his creation a rather decent young American family, a mother, a little son, and a father. The husband is German, and his name is Eric, and he still has not taken out his second papers. Special circumstances cause our little family to visit the homeland of our hero, Germany. Well, up to now, everything is in the best order. But once he arrives at home, the whole picture changes. Our Mr. Eric, who up to now is well-mannered and quite civilized, turns within one second into a rabid Nazi of the worst sort. And the things he does now as a Nazi actually make every humanitarian heart beat in waves of indignation. And our Mr. Shinsgel has written this Nazi drama quite fascinatingly. One could hardly wait for the next installment. But oh, what a shock when our dear Mr. Eric wants to divorce his faithful wife in order to marry the pretty wife of his father. His father is forced to admit that he is a non-Aryan. His mother, who died so soon, came from Belgium and was a Jewess. So far the story, Mr. Shinsgel. But the moral of the whole story don't trust any human being if he is not Aryan. Involuntarily, Mr. Shinskull has hit the nail on the head. With irrefutable accuracy, he has recognized the Jew and has enumerated all the qualities which have made the chosen people so unpopular. I am sure that every German and every American reader of the serial heaved a big sigh of relief when they read the final installment because this final article showed that Mr. Eric did not act so disgustingly because he had become a Nazi, but because he had a Jewish mother. The immediate change of attitude, the egotism, the brutality, the cowardice, the lying, all those characteristics of Eric are the typical characteristics of the race of Eric's mother. Anyway, we ought to thank Mr. Shinsko for his understanding of the real problem. How abhorrent. In another letter to the editor, what interests me most one of the most enthusiastic readers of your magazine is the anti-Nazi propaganda stuff. The best of it, unquestionably. I married a Nazi, I must admit. I could hardly wait for the next issue to tell the town what a barbaric Nazi German this Eric was. And now, at the end of the story, I have to apologize because Eric is a Jew. In all the world, how could Mr. Shinskull make such a slip slappiness pro-Jewish anti-Nazi propagandist right in our faces. I'm afraid that the intent of this fantastic story has failed. They were also very favorable on Charles Lindbergh, who was a, another staunch anti-Semite and pro-Nazi. 
practical jokes that Lindbergh played. Why Lindbergh acts that way. Even though the Liberty Magazine says that Lindbergh's views may not be our views, they certainly are not mine. As a longtime observer of the international scene, I think Lindbergh is wrong, terribly wrong, and that it would be a tragedy for our country and for the world if we followed his leadership in this crisis. But I see no reason to doubt the sincerity of that leadership. It is sometimes difficult to maintain this detached attitude in view of the tendency of certain types of organizations which contrived to turn his meetings into something which resemble those that Hitler organized in Germany during his rise to power. For example, these reports of his New York meeting announced as being held under the auspices of the America First Committee. The hall was packed with members of the Christian Front, the Christian Mobilizers, American Patriots, Crusaders for Americanism, Social Justice Clubs, Committee for the Preservation of America, German-American Bund, and various other fifth column organizations. And remember, Father Coughlin's involved in a lot of these things as well. Outside the hall, thousands of persons milled about. Inside, the speakers were frequently interrupted by jubating cries from the audience. Young boys and bespectacled elderly women sold copies of Father Coughlin's social justice outside the hall and did a good business. All of the stops of sympathy were pulled when John F. Condon the go-between in the Lindbergh kidnapping case got up from a second-row seat, mounted the stage, and shook hands with Colonel Lindbergh. In a moment, Colonel Lindbergh was engulfed. He was rescued by detectives of the Alien Squad, a group of policemen assigned exclusively to the task of ferreting out un-American activities. Yet the Klan and the Boone cheer Lindbergh as they kiss under the fiery cross. They unite the first time at the Jersey Rally, and they endorse fifth column work, etc. Even more disturbing is the open rejoicing in Berlin following each one of his former colonel's appeals to his countrymen. Johannes Steele, WMCA commentator, is authority for the statement that this recurring last verse of the five stanza number is a current Nazi nightclub favorite. Heil Lindbergh, Fuhrer of America, who will destroy Plutonic democracy, the Jews, and Freemasonry in the United States. The world menace of the Tsar. Will Hitler strike first? More women in Hitler's life? What Hitler promised? What's going on in Hitler's head? Good old liberty is continuing its policy of giving us Informative, stimulating articles. Such an article was the one about Hitler by George Sylvester Viverek. The future of Europe depends largely on the youth of Germany. One reason why Viverek's article was so absorbing was that he threw a searchlight into the mind of a man who sways a vast section of Germany's youth. It's going to be an arresting spectacle during the next few years to watch Hitler in his brown fascist shirt fight the Bolshevists with his red flag. An article like When I Take Charge of Germany makes Liberty's readers shout encore, even though they're writing articles against Lindbergh, for Lindbergh, against Hitler, for Hitler. People were writing in asking for more pro-Nazi materials during Viverek's time as editor. And some of them even liked what Hitler was going to do. And they published a letter in, in the Liberty magazine. Is Liberty prophetic? I'll say so. And whoever read What Hitler Will Do Next by George Sylvester Viverek in the May 14th Liberty Magazine will agree with me that the world-shaking events of last September were astonishingly forecast nearly five months ahead of time. In that article, Viverek said, Hitler believes that the majority of the three and a half million Germans parceled out to Czechoslovakia gaze wistfully across the border. In one form or another, they will return to Germany. And Viverek said further, Hitler's first move will be to consolidate his gains, to penetrate the Danubian countries economically and psychologically. Seven other objectives were given as follows. An understanding with Italy and England, friendship with Japan, and if possible, the United States. Liberation from Europe, from the hegemony of France. 
the destruction of, quote, international capitalism and international Marxism, to which Hitler represent the two faces of Judaism. And the, of course, that's what Henry Ford and Judge Rutherford would push in as well, just as Hitler did. Consolidation so far as feasible of all Germans in mid-Europe under the flag of greater Germany. German leadership in Central Europe. The penetration of the Balkans with but not against Italy and the resurrection of the road from Berlin to Baghdad with, but not against Great Britain. The restoration of Germany's colonies and the acquisition of raw materials on a gigantic scale. Expansion in Europe at the expense of Russia. After Czechoslovakia, what next? Now that Hitler has, to quote Viverick again, an understanding with Italy and England, let us be prepared for another Teuton camp within a year. Come on, Liberty, predict some more. Look into the crystal ball of your common sense and imagination and shoot. If the leading statesman of the world only had your prophetic soul, history might be written differently. There's even an article on national disunity, why Hitler watched our election. Did he, as planned, control six million votes? Here's an amazing revelation. There's even a series of fictional articles called Lightning in the Night. The story of the invasion of America. Now, the story, as it progresses, is very neutral, but not completely unfavorable towards the Nazis, and it all ends in a stalemate. Now, spoiler alert, uh, when it ends in a stalemate, it appears that Hitler could not take it, and he ends his own life. This was written a few years before the end of World War II. That's exactly how Hitler's life ended several years later. And Hitler committing suicide at the end. Will human greed and selfishness destroy civilization? God and Dr. Goebbels. Rudolf Hess, the mystery of the man I knew. Hitler's coming doom. And so on and so forth. These are the type of source material the Watchtower and the Golden Age are using in this 1920s and 1930s period. Much of that quack medical advice they were publishing came from these anti-Semitic and pro-Nazi Germany sources. This is much of what Rutherford and the other Watchtower members were basing their ideas on at the time. When we search the source materials of the periodicals and the ideas they were using, this is what it is. Remember, Rutherford saved and reprinted in his Vindication book international Jewish banker conspiracy letters for 30 years from his time before Watchtower when he campaigned for the Populist Party and William Jennings Bryan, as well as using Henry Ford's Dearborn Independent and Ford's International Jew, which was also based on forgeries and anti-Semitism. So again, more Watchtower ideas based on literal forgeries. And once again, William Jennings Bryan is giving lectures at the same chiropractic events that McFadden is at. And once again, Williams was the chosen one. Bryan, William Jennings Bryan was the chosen one of Rutherford. So they're, they're all in this click, so to say. And yeah, I think that's why Rutherford was influenced by the chiropractic stuff is because of the Populist Party. The Populist Party and their uh, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories that influenced Rutherford and brought into Watchtower and also quack medical advice and, and forgeries that Rutherford also borrowed through his influence from uh Brian and the Populist Party as well, and brought that into Watchtower too. And, and what's sad is from the sound of Rutherford's writings, he wished he could have had the power and influence Henry Ford had. Forged to read my Like he was looking for that pat on the back. Like he was looking, come sit, sit at the podium with us. He was looking, it was as if he was looking for that recognition in that circle with Definitely, uh, William Jennings Bryan was, was a higher 
up there. So was Father Coughlin and all that up there. But Rutherford was was a small puppy at the table of the big dogs that he wanted to be a bigger part of. And when it didn't, he didn't get the recognition, he literally made Bible prophecies about himself to become more important than even them. But I think he believed these things. Yes. He believed these things when he was with the populist party before he was ever in the watchtower. And so when he becomes president of the watchtower society, he slowly starts introducing these ideas and makes it a part of what watchtower is today based on both anti-Semitic and these medicinal conspiratorial ideas. I like this one. The New Yorker's June 13th, 1925 issue published a parody advertisement that has McFadden's body and William Jennings Bryan's head, <laughs> the same body. So it's showing the link between these two men. You know, they were lecturing at the same locations as, as you mentioned. I like I like the title, the per make yourself the perfect boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> and just like Henry Ford, McFadden, in his Liberty magazine, which Watchtower and Golden Age also quoted from, they weren't shy in their blatant support for Adolf Hitler, and we could include Coughlin in that as well. You, you uh, recommended and talked about a book that I just purchased. It can't happen here. And after reviewing everything we've gone over, and I'm going to say especially Watchtower and all the stuff we're discussing at this point with the roadmap, uh, it is literally, the book was written, what, 1935-ish? Yeah. 30? Okay. It's a snapshot of everything we are saying here with it, with an alternate universe ending. <laughs> um, kind of but, like Philip K. Dick's The Man in the High Castle. If you haven't seen that on Amazon, check it out. It's very interesting. But, but it, it, it's really, uh, he caught the, the time period very well. As he's describing it, you're seeing, and he's mentioning even by name, but it, it literally is. You could see that time period in the book, and you could see it with, with the research we're showing here on screen. Rutherford was a snapshot of that time period. And if we can't get anything else across to you to maybe ease you down another way of thinking to reevaluate what your belief are, we hope at least that does. Maybe that touches somebody in a different way. And as we said, there are those who questioned. And the enterprise, as we stated earlier, should be commended for publishing an article which was contrary to the view that Watchtower was pushing at the time. Granted, it didn't end well for the enterprise, but they should they were commend they should be commended for not towing the party line completely. As with many of Watchtower's conspiracies, their aversion to the American Medical Association had foundations in anti-Semitic conspiracies as well, and pseudoscience. Uh, there's an article in the Golden Age where they specifically labeled the editor of the American Medical Association's paper, Dr. Morris Fishbein, who happened to be Jewish, in very unflattering words. And the quotation in the Golden Age says that this reputation of the Journal of the American Medical Association in general in the United States, its editor is of the type of Jew that crucified Jesus Christ. That is a strong, strong statement. Again, as we said earlier at the beginning of, of this particular segment, you don't call you don't call people out on that. Time Magazine and the American Medical Association labeled this quotation or, or the source of the quotation from the American Association for Medical Physical Research as quack research. And it was founded by Albert Abrams. And remember, Albert Abrams is the creator of that machine that Rutherford and Watchtower was using in promoting 
for various cures, the Abrams machine. He made a lot of money doing it. I mean, $5 million at that time is quite a bit in today's standards. Not only will we look at the Abrams machine, but we will also talk about another anti-Semitic group that was influenced by Judge Rutherford and the Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs>